Good afternoon. The uh, next item of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. And the portfolio of today is transport net zero and just transition. Again, should a member wish to seek to ask a supplementary question, they should press the request to speak button during the relevant question or enter the letters RTS and chat function during the relevant question. And at question number one, I call Stephen Kerr. To, uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its policy is for the maintenance and rebuilding of road infrastructure. Minister Fiona Hislop. The Scottish Government is committed to maintaining and safely operating our transport assets as set out in the National Transport Strategy. Our motorway and truck net road network is continually inspected with the information used to inform investment decisions. Investment in safely operating and maintaining the network will increase from over £510 million this year to over £668 million in 2024-25 an increase of 31%, which will be focused on the highest priority safety critical maintenance, as well as supporting our wider commitments on road safety, air quality, climate change adaptation and resilience to severe weather events. Stephen Kerr. Well, I thank the Minister for that reply, but given the fact that spending on roads has reduced from £502 million to £26 million, a reduction of 4,000% in eight years, isn't it time for the Scottish Government to be honest and tell the people of Scotland it doesn't really care one jot about roads and thinks that car use is somehow malevolent? That's certainly what the Scottish Green Party, who seem to be in charge of this government, think. How else would the Minister explain these catastrophic reductions on spending on roads and will the SNP Green Government ever commit to proper funding road infrastructure? Minister. I, I would explain his comments by the failure of the Conservative Party to even barely do their homework. Read the budget statement, read the budget itself. I have just listened to my answer, which was that there has been a 31% increase in road maintenance. I think he might be referring to um, a press release from the Scottish Conservatives, which was actually about major developments, not major road infrastructure, as asked by Mr Kerr, which uh, indicated that they are Committed £450 million, which was the work on the A9, which must happen. The Cabinet Secretary came to this chamber and announced that if they can't even get a basic understanding of the difference in budgets between road maintenance, which has been up by 31%, and road project development, then I think it means that the Conservative Party really has, has to get back to studying and doing their homework before they come to this chamber. A supplementary, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Welcome. What I read on page 62 of the, uh, the budget document as a 41% increase in trunk road critical safety, maintenance, and infrastructure to £524.7 million. Mr. Kerr previously blustered that this budget is about priorities. Has he indicated to the Minister where he or any other Tory MSP would deprioritise expenditure in order to fund their myriad demands for additional ex uh, expending? And is, he, uh, and is she astonished? that Mr Kerr, who clearly needs to go back to school, isn't aware that you cannot reduce any figure by more than 100 per cent. So 4,000 per cent actually decrease doesn't actually exist mathematically, Mr Kerr. Minister. Well, I think this Parliament is um, very lucky to have uh, a, a talent enabled convener of the Finance Committee that can work his way through the budget documents. The Conservative Party and Mr Kerr don't put forward proposals on what they would deprioritise to, uh, to fund their myriad of different uh, demands for additional expenditure. And the member is quite right to identify the increase in spending for critical safety, uh, maintenance, and trunk road infrastructure. And that element has increased by 41% because we have to and must, and this government always will, keep our roads safe. Question number two, Claire Hockey. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to encourage more people to use bus and rail services in the Rutherglen constituency. Minister Fiona Hislop. We have committed to invest almost £2.5 billion in the coming year to support the public transport network, ensuring a viable alternative to car use and enabling people to make sustainable choices. In South Lanarkshire, over 140,000 concessionary travel card holders benefit from free bus travel, uh, making over 565,000 journeys under the schemes in December alone, and Clare Hockey's constituents also benefit from a very frequent rail service with six trains per hour to central Glasgow and the West End, and from lower rail fares due to our peak fares removal pilot, which was extended until June. Clare Hockey. 
I uh, thank the Minister for that answer. Getting more people to use public transport will help tackle two of the most significant challenges facing us today, the cost of living crisis and the climate emergency. Through bringing Scotland's rail into public hands and the pilot to scrap peak rail fares, as well as enabling free bus travel for over 60s, people with disability and young people under the age of 22, this SNP government is taking decisive action to promote public transport usage. Another way I believe that we could increase the number of people using public transport is through publicly controlled bus services. Can the Minister outline how local authorities like the South Lanarkshire Council can now do this through new powers given to them within the Transport Scotland Act? Minister. The Scottish Government has now delivered all the bus powers within the Transport Scotland Act 2019, which enable uh, local transport authorities to consider all the powers available to them, including partnership working, franchising and local authority run services, which sits alongside their ability to subsidise services. And the 2019 Act provides an enhanced suite of flexible options for local transport authorities to improve bus services according to their local needs, and it will be for each uh, authority to determine which powers are suitable for their specific areas. And supplementary, Graeme Simpson. Mm. Thank you. The Minister knows that it's my view that one of the best ways of getting people onto uh, public transport, uh, including in Rutherglen, um, is to have lower and simpler fares. So can she tell us um, if it is still her intention to publish the Fair Fares Review this month? Minister, um, it is my intention to uh, publish the Fair Fares review uh, as soon as possible. I would hope it will be this month. It may be into the beginning of next month. Uh, but I, I appreciate his interest, and I think he makes a very important point that simplification of fares, not just necessarily within the bus arrangements, but across um, all the different transport modes are really important. And I, I can encourage him that I think once it's published, that's the type of discussion and debate we can have in terms of taking forward policy in this area. Question number three, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Jenny. Also, to ask the Scottish Government how much has been invested in the trunk road network in the Greenock and Inverclyde constituency since Amy took over management of the network. Minister Fiona Hislop. Uh, Transport Scotland uh, records uh, trunk road maintenance and spend through the operating company's contracts on a whole route basis. Therefore, figures cannot be disaggregated for ex exact spend between specific locations. Notwithstanding this, since the start of the Amy South West contract in August 2020 and up to the latest report to the end of September 2023, this government has invested £25.9 million in the maintenance of the A78 and £77.6 million on the A8 trunk roads through Amy's contract. These figures cover all aspects of maintenance, including resurfacing work, drainage improvements, road safety measures, maintenance of structures, incident management and winter treatments. Stuart McMillan. Thank you. I thank the Minister for that reply. And since Amy took over the contract from Scotland Transfer in 2020, I think it's clear to see that there has been additional work taking place in the A8 and A78 in my constituency. Amy took over during the pandemic and inherited significant challenges. And I do want to thank Amy for the work they have done. But can the Minister assure my, my constituents that Amy will continue to invest in the trunk road network in my constituency and that further improvements uh, to the road surface will take place in the next financial year, including at the Bolson train station? Minister. Um, I thank the member for recognising the maintenance effort efforts of investment in the Inverclyde area and I think as he notes especially during the challenges of the recent pandemic obviously Transport Scotland work diligently with its operating companies to ensure trunk road maintenance and provide safe use and re uh, reliability um, for those that, that use that. I can reassure them in the year 24-25 financial year investment will continue on the A78 and A8 trunk roads uh, with an anticipated programme of improvement works totalling £4.7 million and I will ask officials uh, to ensure that Mr McMillan is updated when the dates are set for certain uh, elements of that. Question number four, Evelyn Tweed. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to realise any potential of na national nature reserves to help achieve net zero through their large-scale impact on nature recovery and biodiversity. Minister Lorna Slater. The purposes of all National Nature Reserves, NNRs, is to restore and manage Scotland's most important natural areas and to give people the opportunity to enjoy and connect with nature. NNRs are crucial for restoring habitats to contribute to achieving net zero and raising awareness of the effects of climate change on people and nature. The Scottish Government is supporting extensive nature recovery work in our nature reserves, including large-scale peatland restoration, deer management for native woodland regeneration, freshwater restoration, and coastal habitat creation. 
NNRs seek to minimize emissions from their management by using electric vehicles and generating renewable energy. Evelyn Tweed. Volunteers have been key to success. Fly, sorry. Volunteers have been key to the success Flanders Moss Nature Reserve is having in improving biodiversity in my constituency. To ask the government what it considers the role of volunteering to be in achieving net zero and how it intends to support volunteers in this area. Minister. The Scottish Government is indebted to the vital contribution volunteers make to biodiversity monitoring, restoration and management, thereby contributing to achieving net zero. There are a range of opportunities on NNRs or through other environmental organisations. At Flanders, volunteers are removing encroaching scrub and installing and repairing dams on the moss to ensure carbon is locked in the peat and remains there, an important nature-based solution for net zero. Recognising the importance of volunteering, we are funding projects such as the Scottish Invasive Species Initiative, where removing invasive non-native species with the help of volunteers is restoring biodiversity and capturing carbon as those habitats recover. A supplementary, Maurice Gordon. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Scotland is one of the most nature-depleted countries on earth, ranked 212 out of 240 on the Biodiversity and Tactness Index. So it's welcome that statutory nature restoration targets are being considered as part of the Natural Environment Bill. However, does the Minister agree that there is a need for a more robust system of holding the Scottish Government to these targets, such as exploring an option for a Scottish environmental court? Minister. Uh, I thank the very member very much for the question. Uh, the member is absolutely right on the state of Scotland's nature and the work that we need to do to restore it. I am willing to uh, uh, you know, hear the member's views on the ideas around an environmental court. I know that that's an idea that's been floated and I'm happy to discuss that more. Question number five, Pam Gozo. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it has made any assessment of the potential impact of its budget on its net zero ambitions. Cabinet Secretary Mary McCallum. Uh, yes, Presiding Officer, this budget includes a climate change assessment, and that assessment highlights that in 24 25 we are committing £4.7 billion in both capital and resource for activities that will have a positive impact on the delivery of our climate change goals. And we have also published the taxonomy uh, assessment of the impact of each budget line alongside the budget. Pam Gosson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. One of the shared priorities within the Verity House Agreement is a commitment to net zero. But the recent budget announcement sees that the regeneration capital grant cut by 27 per cent. Given 82 per cent of all emissions are within the scope of influence of Scottish local authorities, it's extremely concerning that COSLA are now casting doubt over Scotland's ambitions. Does the Cabinet Secretary share COSLA's concerns and what discussions have been had about allocating additional capital resources to allow further investment in net zero by Scotland's local authorities? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, Presiding officer, the views of, of COSLA and our local authorities um, in pursuit of our climate targets are very important to me because we need a whole of society, whole of government approach to this. But, and, and the regeneration uh, capital grants uh, are an important part of that. But the, the, in the, the clue is in the title, presiding officer, capital grants. And uh, it is uh, a little ironic to be questioned uh, by Pam Gozel on uh, capital funding when it is in fact her colleagues in the UK government who have dealt Scotland one of the most difficult budgetary challenges we've had, certainly in the devolution era, on account of their financial mismanagement, and in particular, their failure to inflation-proof the capital budget, Absolutely. slashing what is then available uh, to Absolutely. Scotland. They have left us, presiding officer, in the worst of all worlds, and this government will do our very best to protect Scotland from that. And supplementary, Colette Stevenson. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what initial assessment the Government has made regarding the potential impact of the UK Government's oil and gas bill on Scotland's net zero ambitions, given it would appear that no level of funding can prevent Scotland's actions from being undermined by Westminster mandating annual North Sea licensing rounds? Cabinet Secretary. Um, President Officer, 
it was very clearly uh, my view that instead of licensing uh, ever more new fossil fuel extraction, which the, the bill the member narrates would propose and doing so on an annual basis, uh, the UK government should absolutely be supporting a just transition. And this, I think, alongside other commitments recently from the UK government, demonstrate that the Tories are not serious about uh, climate change, nor, I should say, on uh, supporting Scotland to realise the enormous renewable energy potential that we have. This situation, presiding officer, is yet another one which makes clear the perversity of the fact that Scotland has the energy whilst Westminster has the power, uh, a situation which uh, cannot be tolerated a moment longer. Question number six, Claire Baker. I am to ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on what, what action it is taking to make rail travel more affordable and attractive for passengers in Mid-Scotland and Fife. Uh, Minister Fiona Hislip. Uh, there is a range of work underway to improve services in Fife. Firstly, due to a £160 million investment by the Scottish Government, a new line to Levermouth will be opened, uh, which, with services commencing in June this year. In addition, the ScotRail peak fares removal pilot has been extended for a further three months until June 2024. This initiative not only supports the government's ambitions for more sustainable travel, but will continue to attract passengers in the members' electoral region and throughout Scotland to, to rail, as it offers passengers significant savings. Clear Baker. Um, I thank the Minister for that response. And while I do welcome the extension of the pilot and the removal of peak fares, the upcoming hike in rail fares that will hit passengers once it ends is not so welcome. As the pilot ends, there will be an 8.7% increase in prices, which follows a 4.8% increase less than a year ago. The cost of rail travel is increasingly uh, becoming expensive, and once the pilot ends, the increase people will see is dramatic. Now, the Minister has already said this afternoon that the delayed fare, fares review will be presented to Parliament in the coming weeks. In addition to that, can I ask when an assessment of the pilot will be made available and what the government is doing to prevent people being priced off the railways? Minister. Uh, on that second point, we will make sure that the evaluation of the pilot will be made available. I would say the disruption to weather with severe weather during the end of 2023 may, may impact on that. And that's why actually the extension will be helpful in providing um, a more rounded view over the piece on the fares issues. Our fares are still comparably lower than the rest of the UK. We've postponed the increase from the normal January date to April, and with the extension of peak fares removal, most commuting journeys will remain cheaper until July 2024 and cheaper than July 23, which itself was a below inflation increase following on fare freezes for season and uh, flex pass tickets. And even with this increase, which affects uh, commuting journeys from July 2024, um, the return fare will be just over a pound of an increase from the year before for a return from Burnt Island to Edinburgh, which I think demonstrates that we're still trying to ensure that our rail uh, travel is affordable. Supplementary, Keith Brown. Hey, can I ask the Minister whether there are any early indications of the impact of the peak fare removal pilot for train users in Mid-Scotland and Fife? Whether she can say what the most frequented trains are in the region and what savings have patrons of the routes had as a result of the action taken by the SNP-led Scottish Government? Minister. So there have been uh, extensive uh, improvements, I think, across different areas within the Fife region. I think between £6 uh, following the fare increase and £7 now are being made per week um, and per, sorry, per journey uh, for many of those that are travelling longer uh, journeys into commuting to, to Glasgow and Edinburgh. I'm happy to correct those figures if they're not accurate. Um, in terms of uh, the difference it's making, uh, I do want to see the evaluation. I do want to reflect on perhaps the disruption that, that we may see to what would have been regular uh, return to journeys in terms of um, that area. But that investment and that uh, uh, ability to invest and continue to invest in our rail services by this government and not only is allowing our decarbonisation to progress but it's also ensuring we have affordable services and I think the, the member would reflect that bringing the uh, Scott Rail services into public ownership has made a whole variety of different initiatives for the benefit of passengers more realisable. Question number seven, Jim Fairley. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to ask the Scottish Government what assessment it has made of any potential impact on the proposed Shinnefoot Junction on the A9 at Octorader after the announcement that Stuart Milne Holmes is going into administration. Minister. 
Um, I was very concerned to hear that Stuart Milne Group, one of a consortium of developers delivering a new junction on the A9 trunk road at Otterada, had ceased trading. Our thoughts lie with the affected employees and their families at this difficult time, as well as uh, home and uh, home buyers. This is clearly a developing situation, and I have therefore asked officials at Transport Scotland to confirm their understanding of the implications of recent events and how they might impact on delivery of the Shinnefoot Junction. I will respond to Mr Fairley's question and his subsequent correspondence as soon as possible. Jim Fairley. I thank the Minister for that response. Now, Muir Homes and Stuart Milne Homes accepted the, 70, the Section 75 placed upon them, which would have seen them fund an on and an off ramp at Shinnefoot and the A9 near Ochterarder. However, after building half the site, they put in a subsequent application, which was rejected by the local authority, which would have seen them construct an off-ramp only. Now, that would push a great deal more traffic through an already very extremely congested Ochterarda, causing very real safety concerns because of a busy section of the A9 with a very dangerous overcarriageway crossing. It has caused a huge amount of upset and fear amongst the local community that a serious accident is going to occur as a result. So with the uncertainty caused by the Stuart Mill no longer being able to be in a position to carry this work out, would the Minister be prepared to look again at the current proposition and call on the reporter's decision to ensure that the residents are served by a safe on and off junction, which will provide the safest possible solution for the residents of Walter Minister. Um, as I said in my initial response, I will need to take a more a considered view on, on this issue as it involves planning. In keeping with the majority of appeals dealt with by the Planning and Environmental Appeals Division, this case has been delegated to a reporter to make a decision on Minister's behalf. Ministers, therefore, have no involvement in the process. While Scottish Ministers can intervene at any point before a final decision is issued on a planning appeal, the issue of a recall direction is a matter for Ministers' discretion, the power used sparingly and normally only in circumstances where a proposal raises issue of genuine national interest. I understand the reporter has issued a notice of intention and as the appeal is still live it would not be appropriate to make comment on the merits of the proposed development at this stage. Question number eight, Pauline McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what consideration it has given to whether there is a need for a regulatory oversight of companies that install low emission heating systems and upgrade homes to be more energy efficient. Minister uh, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. The regulation of consumer protection is reserved to the UK government, but the Scottish government recognises the importance of consumers being assured that any work carried out is done to a high standard. Using the microgeneration certification, certification scheme installers and Trustmark registered businesses is a requirement of accessing Scottish government funding. So I would encourage anyone considering energy efficiency upgrades to seek expert advice from trusted sources such as the Scottish Government's Home Energy Scotland service. Polly McNeill. Can I thank the Minister for the exchange of letters with me on this subject, which I really care a lot about, because the Minister will be aware that of the 1,300 companies that we currently have, only more uh, 4,000 installers across the UK, so we need to get a lot more uh, in, in time to come. Last month, Citizens Advice warned that existing consumer protection is insufficient and could allow rogue traders and scammers to prey on people's good intentions. There will be many examples of this. Notwithstanding what the Minister said, that this is a matter for the Westminster Parliament, but does he agree with the Citizens, citizens Advice that the absence of minimum legal standards for all heat pump installations means that there will continue to be a potential risk to consumers if there is not a single accreditation scheme for all installers in the net zero market. Minister. Uh, Citizens Advice and indeed uh, Polly McNeill are right to draw attention to this. We're concerned about the, uh, the risk uh, that people would uh, encounter, the kind of installers that she's drawing attention to. We do have to be clear about the things that this government can do and the things that this government can't do, but must put pressure on the UK government to act. In terms of what we can do, more than a year ago, we published the Heat and Building Supply Chain Delivery Plan, and since then, we've been working actively uh, to uh, take forward the work under that plan to make sure that we have the skilled capacity, the high-quality skilled capacity 
uh, across Scotland that we need if we're going to see the acceleration both of energy efficiency and of zero emission heating systems that the country needs to see. We make, uh, as I say, the MCS and the Trustmark uh, requirements part of the Scottish Government funding package, uh, but uh, it may be that Pauline McNeill has colleagues who might come into uh, ministerial office down south uh, at some point later this year, uh, and I think the burden may fall on them uh, to do some of the work that the current UK Government has failed to do. And supplementary, Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presenting Officer. According to responses I have received from the Scottish Government, they currently do not record or track the number of businesses operating in the energy efficiency sector or what certifications they hold. How does the Minister believe it is possible to effectively support the growth of this sector and ensure homeowners are protected from falling victim to cowboy contractors without gathering this kind of basic information? Minister. Well, I think, uh, rather like Polly McNeill's initial question, some of this does relate to the consumer protection responsibilities. This is about the regulation of businesses, which Brian Whittle is asking about. That falls under consumer protection. It falls under the responsibility of the UK government. Uh, it may be that he would like this parliament and this government to take responsibility for more of the powers that are currently reserved, and I think we would do rather a better job than has been done uh, by the, the current UK government, which is ripping up climate commitments left, right and centre at the moment. And supplementary, Beatrice Wishart, who is joining us remotely. Ms Wishart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the past, some properties in Shetland where energy efficiency measures have been installed by certified non-local contractors have been on the receiving end of shoddy workmanship, with little comeback for the householder once the non-local contractor has left the aisles. Meanwhile, local contractors, often small businesses, can't compete for this work because they say the time and cost of certification is too high. It's vital that there are reputable installers carrying out this type of work, so how can the Scottish Government help to ensure sure smaller businesses can access that important certification. Minister. Uh, this is an extremely important aspect, and not only in relation to, to Shetland, but there are other uh, rural and island communities around Scotland where the kind of experience that uh, Beatrice Wishart Wish has described has taken place. Uh, there has been a recent consultation uh, in relation to the, the MCS, the Microgeneration Certification Scheme, uh, and a relaunched version of that is due to be uh, in place later this year. I think uh, by summer this year, that scheme, which is not under the control of the Scottish Government, but we're pleased to see progress there. And I think one of the things that they're intending to do is remove and reduce some of the barriers to certification which do currently exist. So I, uh, I hope that we'll be able to update uh, Beatrice Russia and other interested members uh, on that activity, although, as I say, it's not within the direct control of the Scottish Government. Thank you, Minister. That concludes portfolio questions on Transport Net Zero and Just Transition. There will be a very short pause before we move on to the next item of business to allow frontbench teams to change position should they so wish. Thank you.